Deputy Speaker. I rise with privilege to render my support to the Appropriation 2020 Bill of 2019. I would like to start first by indicating that this budget, unlike a lot of other administrations on the eve of an election, is certainly not a knee-jerk reaction as a budget that comes before an election where you try to jam in all kinds of things that you never did during the previous years of your tenure. We have listened basically to presentations from the opposite side and uh, regrettably all of them thus far seem to be following the same MO. Speak about the withholding of the IMF report, speak about the CBI program which is considered to be on life support Ironically, the same life support we met it on in 2015. Speak about nepotism, especially directed at the Honorable Prime Minister, and then use the floor of the Parliament as a bully pulpit to get across the recently contrived provisions in what is supposed to be the 2020 manifesto of the Labour Party. Thus far, that is my assessment of the contribution from the other side. As would have been done last year, by denigrating the budget, and claiming that there's nothing in it. It has come across, and it came across then as well in the previous year's budget, that unfortunately the opposite side has not taken the time to actually research the budget in a concerted manner so that we could have a real robust debate inside of this house, which I think the people of this country deserve. We have listened to the policies that have been put forward by the Labour Party in response to the upcoming budget. And uh, contrary to what the last speaker, the Honourable Senator, indicated that the government side has chosen through, to throw cold water on their ideas because we believe, and if I'm quoting him correctly, that the policies that they have are too progressive and that we think that they're too good for the people of this country. Well, for the record, I would like to indicate that there is no policy progressive or even more progressive that could be too good for the people of this country. What concerns us on this side is how you're going to pay for those policies because the money must come from somewhere. And so far, they have failed to indicate through these policies how it will be paid for. And one has to wonder if it is a matter that the intention to finance these policies is going to come from a reintroduction of personal income tax which is a very serious consideration, Madam Deputy Speaker, and here's why. When personal income tax, and dare I say most forms of personal income tax would have been abolished in the 1980s under the Pam administration, we began to see for the first time in this country a breaking up of the chasm that existed in the Federation, where you had the haves and the have-nots. And for the first time, we began to see the burgeoning or the development of a middle class in this country. Because by getting rid of the personal income tax, or most of it, which I'll explain afterwards, you know, for the first time, saw in this country a situation where you had communities being developed where none were. For example, that's the, re that's the response from us having an Earl Moon. Further expansion in terms of Matinley further expansion down by the Boyd's area in terms of middle income housing as well. This is what the abolition of personal income tax did. And to explain what I mean by most forms of personal income tax, because whether we like to answer it or not, or acknowledge it or not, when it comes to the seventh payment, the um, housing and social development levy, no matter which way you turn it, no matter what you call it, it is still a form of personal income tax because it is a tax on your income as a payroll tax that has been dedicated to address social services needs in the country or at least attempt to assist with it. So that is what I will say from the outset as I preface my remarks. As I stated, I will start with the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health for 2020 has been accorded a provision on the recurrent um, expenditure side of 55,453,408. And on the capital expenditure side, $6.5 million for a total of 61.9 million or 2.2% increase over what we would have been allocated for 2019. 
And as I get into the discussion, I want to remind the public that the Ministry of Health and its services are delineated in two categories, institution-based services, which cover the hospitals, the cardiac home, etc., and uh, the community-based services, which would include our 11 community health centers, the DMO clinics, and also the mental health day treatment center. Now, I would like to preface the rest of what I have to say for the next couple of minutes by putting in context, as I have done every single budget, the situation analysis that we have at present in the health sector, especially bearing in mind what we found when we took office in 2015. We would have, in 2015, inherited a situation where we had some amount of crumbling infrastructure, even though some of the infrastructure was not old. In the case of the Mary Child's Hospital, there was evidence that not a concerted and regular maintenance program had been put in place at that facility that would have been open, if I'm not mistaken, in the mid-1980s. And as a result of that, that facility would have had to have been closed for the most part once we discovered in 2015 that the ceiling over the section of the female ward at that facility had fallen in. And thankfully for us, no patients were in that section at the time. As a result of that, well over $1 million had to be spent to refurbish Mary Charles, and it was then reopened in August of 2016. In light of the high incidence of cancers that exist in St. Kitts and Nevis, the Ministry of Health would have also invested in a, the creation of an oncology unit that would cater to cancer patients with chemotherapy-based treatments in the first instance. We are not yet at the point where we can meaningfully take on radiotherapy, but however that is available in nearby countries, the closest of which is Antigua and Barbuda. We would have added a mental health the treatment center by December of 2016, and of course, this was a case where this particular project had been lingering at the level of the BNTF, going back to as far as 2006. And of course, a lot of the issues surrounding that particular project had to do with indecision as to where it would be located. However, that facility eventually was built. Regrettably, we would have lost most of the funding because that BNTF cycle was just about to end and there was no way in which we could have completed the facility by July of 2015, having taken office only in February of 2015. So regrettably, we would have only been able to hold on from the CDB to just a little under $200,000 of the funding, and then the rest had to be financed by the government directly. Basically, ma Madam Deputy Speaker, these capital investments that we have made in health is an indication of how seriously the government takes health. Health is something that affects all of us. It transcends politics, it transcends socioeconomic issues based on what we are dealing with at the moment. We would have also in inherited a situation at the institution-based health services where we would have had a hospital that would have been built and completed, I should say completed rather, by 2004 but then, of course, when we took office, there was widespread leakage from the concrete roof, seepage of moisture coming through the walls, seepage of moisture coming through those areas of the roof that had been designed with parapets, including the medical ward and also the psychiatric ward. And uh, what ended up happening is that a number of interventions would have been done by public works prior to our taking office as an attempt to fix the problem. And eventually, we then had to go to a more costly but more efficient system of a skin cover for the hospital provided by SWEPCO, which then ended up costing the hospital and the government well over $1 million to correct that roofing issue. So, so far, this is what we have found. In the midst of all of these capital improvements that we are doing, we are also mindful of the fact that the issue of NCDs confronts this country in a way no other illness or group of illnesses would have confronted us. And this is barring all of those poverty-related illnesses, underdevelopment illnesses that would have pervaded life in St. Kitts and Nevis going back to the wartime era and post-wartime era. And now we are having a formidable challenge taking place where some 83% of our debts can be attributed 
to non-communicable diseases such as cancers, diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, etc. I should, for the record, um, clear up a misconception that happens to be out there, however, and I heard it being spoken about up to last week, that over 80% of the people in this country are suffering with NCDs, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Because essentially, we cannot confuse what is a leading mortality rate with a high prevalence rate of any life-threatening illness. It simply means that 83% of the persons who are dying are persons who are suffering from NCDs. And it would be a very irresponsible leap of faith to state that 83% of the people in this country are suffering from NCDs. So I just wanted to correct that. A second response that we have in place now is the issue of the cardiac catheterization unit that is presently being built out. We are grateful for the support of our own son of the soil, Dr. Frank Laws, who is a cardiologist in Denver, Colorado, who has been assisting us with this project. And it comes in recognition of the fact that we have a number of patients presenting with heart attacks and so forth. We also have a number of stroke patients. And even though the cardiac catheterization unit is primarily meant for cardiac patients, some of the interventions can be of help to stroke patients, given the commonality of the illnesses being due to the formation of blood clots. And it just differs as to where they are. Come December, late December of this year, I should add that there will be installed at the a &E department as a phase one to this rollout, the provision of point of care systems, which would allow us to do both CBC and chemistry profiling right there in the a &E. So we do not have to call out lab staff on call after hours on holidays or on weekends, because by the use of cartridges and these small devices, we will be able with the aid of the mobile unit in which it is installed, to do the emergency testing right there, including um, cardiac proteins and so forth and enzymes to determine the risk factors that the patients might be suffering from. And by the units being mobile, they will also be able to be used in theater if they are needed to be emergency intervention that would require rapid blood work. The, price, the cost of that project has been pegged at the first instance at $1.5 million. What I'm happy to report at this point is that thus far the phase one is not costing this government anything because that portion has been generously donated by Dr. Frank Laws himself and for that the government is indeed grateful. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, I would also use this medium to remind the public that the work of the government in terms of carrying out the services as it relates to healthcare is not something that we can do alone. It is something that requires partnership, partnership with the people of this country in terms of getting them to understand the importance of good health and well-being and the role that they should be playing in their own dietary needs, exercise regimen, spirituality, whatever your concept of God is in terms of trying to live a peaceful existence because there's a clear correlation between that and good health. Other areas of public-private partnership include the private sector, who might be assisting us in certain endeavors. One such endeavor that we do have the benefit of is the CT scan machine, which is a joint venture 50-50 between the government and the St. Kitts Biomedical Research Foundation at Boreo. This CT scan is located right in the, cardi the radiotherapy section of the hospital and would have been installed at the tune of $500,000. I am happy to report that between August of 2016 and November 2018, which would have been the full build out up until then, we would have had some 1,354 procedures done. And then for this year, 2019 alone, we would have done an additional 649 for a total of uh, 2,003. I also wish to point out that um, Essentially, we could not have done this without the placement of trust between the parties involved. And for that, I have to thank Drs. Jean Redmond and of, um, Dr. Andy Redmond, his stepson, who stepped out of the box and took the initiative to assist us in this regard. We also have coming on stream in the near future the completion of the Tabernacle Health Center. And I would have already used this podium in previous sittings of the appropriation bill debate
to discuss their track record as it relates to that particular facility, bearing in mind that the older structure became inoperable and unusable by virtue of the lack of renovation and widespread termite damage. When we would have visited the facility when we took office, the termite damage was that widespread that it even um, spread to the nearby trees and the septic system had imploded. As a result of that, the health center in Tabernacle had to be housed and still is until we open shortly in the basement of the daycare center, which is not the most ideal location, but thank God it is much better than where they had to move from. So we look forward to the completion of this particular project in the very near future. There's still a lot of ground to cover, Madam De Deputy Speaker, and the government is doing its best to address these issues, as well as other issues such as productivity improvements in the sector, professionalism that we want to see an improvement in, and so forth. And as a result of that, we are still very much in the middle of an ongoing program with PAHO as it relates to human resources for health bearing in mind the needs that we have and our preference that the skill sets that we need to power the Ministry of Health would be located in St. Kitts by our own people. Until such time, we are forced to continue with recruitment of medical as well as nursing specialties from outside of the Federation. So for example, at present, we have some 27 foreign nurses here who have post-grad specialties in areas such as the neonatal unit, the ICU, hemodialysis, etc., And we continue to encourage our local nurses to take advantage of the opportunity. We are willing to contemplate the sponsorship of their post-grad education if that is the case, but we would much prefer to have our local people do this because based on the standing orders of the civil service, when you recruit foreign staff, you pay a premium to have them here and the savings could have gone elsewhere in the Ministry of Health. We would also wish to point out, Madam Deputy Speaker, that in the middle of all of this, we want to ensure that at our own local level, we see the kind of results coming where within the wider ambit of the human resources for health issue, that we have more of a healthy flow of professionals and succession planning through the system so that we continue to build on the gains that we have made over time. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the impact of crime on healthcare. And in 2019 in particular, there is a welcome change in terms of the impact of crime on the health services of this country. And of course, a lot of this is due to the peace initiative that has been garnered over the better part of this year. And I will provide the statistical data to bear this out. In 2019, during the period January to August of 2019, JNF would have recorded seven cases of gunshot wounds as opposed to 29 in 2018. During the same period, we would have had one of them requiring surgery this year as opposed to 10 last year. Six of them requiring hospitalization this year as opposed to 23 last year. We also recorded some 13 cases of stab wounds this year as opposed to 34 in 2018. And in the same period, we would have also um, noted that there were some three cases of sexual assault as opposed to 12 in 2018. And as I get down to the narrative as it relates to social services and gender, I will come back to a development of an anomaly as it relates to the issue of sexual assault in this country, because there seems to be a misunderstanding that we have an increase in rape in this country. We do not have an increase in rape. What we are really seeing is that more victims of rape are becoming braver in terms of reporting the assaults. For example, last year, the police would have recorded one case of rape, whereas the hospital would have treated 12 cases of rape, which is telling us that while people are eager as victims to seek out care, emergency care after an assault, they are stopping short of reporting the rape. And that is something that we need to fix in this country because it tells us then that for whatever reasons, victims are fearful to file a report and we need to build more confidence in them and in 
the law enforcement agencies who are there to support them when such issues arise. Now, the data that I've just provided indicates to us that in 2019, there has been a 75.9% decrease in gun-related injuries, and that is a remarkable achievement. By extension, we also saw a 61.8% decrease in stab wounds. That, too, is remarkable. And a 75% decrease in sexual assault cases presented at JNF. Let me repeat that. A 75% decrease in sexual assault cases presented to JNF. I'm doing that deliberately for clarity. We have also noted that most of the victims of these gunshot wounds are people, young men who are attracted to gangs, etc. And for several years, including the life of the previous government, the hospital had become a revolving door for these young men who as soon as they get treated, they come right back in again. And sometimes for the successive visits, they may not be able to walk out on their two feet to leave. We've actually had issues in the previous administration we are the persons who commit the crime were waiting right outside the door of the theater to finish off the person who had just been patched up, and that too is wrong, okay? So we are grateful for the gains that we are seeing in that regard. Now, the ministry is also trying to ensure that the partnerships that we are developing as it relates to healthcare would help us in the long run in terms of the attainment of the sustainable development goals, and of course, one of those goals speak um, specifically to health care. The partnership, for example, that we have with the CT scan project has really done an amazing amount of help for us because that is money that we would not have had to put elsewhere and now we're doing it, we are able to do otherwise. Now the partnership, the Taiwanese um, government in the addition of some extra gambrohemodialysis machines to the point where we now have seven and that is necessary for us because as of the end of November, I think we had well over 30 patients who were actually being treated uh, with hemodialysis several times per week. And of course, it is a big part of the cadre of diseases that constitute NCDs for which we need to continue working towards reduction. I'm also happy to report that the chronic kidney disease program with the Taiwanese Embassy is about to go through another phase starting from April of 2020, ending in March 2024, valued at just over $1 million with some US $360,000.4 coming from the government of um, St. Kitts and Nevis and $160,000 coming from the Taipei General Hospital, the Veterans Hospital, and the entire thing would have been worth 1.5 million. So we do express our continued gratitude to the government and people of Taiwan for their ongoing support to us in this endeavor. Some of the ongoing challenges, apart from the NCDs that we are facing, include high rates of absenteeism. We also suffer from the stress on our workers, especially when having to be coming out um, for emergency calls, thank God they have been reduced based on the data I gave earlier. And of course, we are seeing a short staffing in terms of our nursing um, complement. We also are looking forward to the connectivity between the health centers and the hospital, and that is taking a bit of time as it relates to the hospital information system for which Taiwan is assisting us. And I should note, however, that on that score, we will be in 2019 Furthering some discussions, we would have started with the Honorable Attorney General and his department, the IT department, in terms of fast-tracking the hospital information system to go over to utilize the technology of the blockchain technology for medical services. It's a technology that has been around since the 1980s but has been underutilized and it will help us to have more synchronicity between the pharmacies, public and private, the hospitals, the specialties that are provided by private doctors, etc., and also the health centers. So that is a cause for advancement in the new year, and that will not cost us anything in 2020 because of the fact that it is a feasibility in that regard. I also would like to point to other challenges that we have, which include HIV AIDS, up until t November 30th of this year, we would have seen some 12 new cases. 
However, only five of these persons, of the 12 persons, were on antiretroviral therapies. And of these new cases, 46% of the people are between the ages of 20 and 29, which is equivalent to six cases. Madam Deputy Speaker, that is cause for concern because it tells us that our young people who represent our most vibrant quadrant of the labor force could be severely compromised in terms of productivity depending on the progression of their illness and especially if they take longer to come forward and voluntarily get into care, chances are they will not have a fighting chance to survive what is a deadly disease which can be treatable and individuals can still have a high quality of life. In total, we have in St. Kitts and Nevis some 172 persons living with HIV and of these persons, 88 of them are on antiretroviral therapy. And I should remind the public that antiretroviral therapies are for free. It doesn't cost you anything. I should also indicate that testing for HIV is completely confidential. No one gets to know your business. Yes, the sample is collected, whether from your private doctor, the DMO's office, the outpatient's area at the hospital, but an algorithm is being used, made up of certain features, maybe your date of birth, your mother's maiden name, other things like that which are unique markers, so that when the, lab, the sample gets to the lab, nobody in the lab can tell that it is Wendy Phipps or Sonia Body's own. So the confidentiality factor is not supposed to be an issue. However, for 2019, some 768 HIV tests would have been done with counseling attached to it. And of course, an additional 433 antenatal patients would have also been tested for HIV. Regrettably, Madam Deputy Speaker, I do not have the data for Nevis, but I was careful to mention the antenatal testing, largely because St. Kitts and Nevis has been successful in gaining the distinction of being one of the smallest countries in the world to have eliminated mother to child transmission of HIV and syphilis, and we want to maintain that status. So that is the reason we would be advocating for every single pregnant mother to be tested and be tested at various points during the pregnancy. Now, we also would have just celebrated World AIDS Day on the 1st of December using the theme, Communities Make the Difference. And that was not by accident, because we know that we are facing challenges when it comes to persons who are afraid to get tested and so forth, but we want them to get tested, we want them to be able to have pre-exposure prophylaxis and so forth so that they can have better outcomes, especially if there might be likely chances of them engaging in risky or unsafe sexual behaviors. The honorable mover of the bill on Thursday would have taken the time to explain that our decisions as it relates to HIV would be garnered towards the attainment of the 90-90-90 targets for HIV and AIDS as it relates to our commitments to UN AIDS and the WHO. And let me just repeat what we mean by that. 90% of all HIV positive persons being tested, 90% of those being tested would be on antiretroviral therapies, and 90% of them who are tested and are on treatment will achieve viral load suppression, which means that when they do subsequent testing for HIV, the levels of the virus in their bloodstream should be negligible. That is what that means. We continue to have uh, available to the public 19 rapid testing sites, which include health centers, hospitals, and certain private doctor's offices, and they are available to render the kind of care and support that we require. We would have also noted that um, in a previous budget presentation, what the figures were in terms of the precious lives that we had lost from the time we first had cases of AIDS in, 19, in the 1980s, I think 1984. And I can tell you that as of the end of November, St. Kitts and Nevis would have lost 437 persons to HIV and AIDS. And of this number, persons who were HIV positive, sorry, but 139 would have died, and this trend is likely to increase regrettably if behavior modification, exposure to testing, and so forth is not done. <coughs> and again, the demographic we are most worried about is the 29 to 68 year old demographic. These are people who are in our active labor force just getting ready to retire on the upper end of that continuum. So we do have some work to do, 
but we are also noticing that the prevalence of HIV seems to be highest in those groups classified as men having sex with men, transgender individuals, commercial sex workers, and their clients. We have had several responses to the challenges that we face. As I indicated, when it comes to the specialties we lack, we have to import those specialties. The Ministry of Health has also embarked on a public education campaign to step up what we are doing in the health promotion unit to the point where we have just recently, within the last 60 days or so, created a new Facebook page. And basically, we are leveraging the power of social media and the fact that St. Kitts and Nevis happens to be one of those jurisdictions that has the distinction of a very high mobile cellular phone penetration rate. So we are taking advantage of that technology as well. In the first week, we went from 50 persons who are following the site to 397 in the following week. So it is telling us that that mode of getting across to the public, especially among young people, is gaining traction. Now, if I can con just continue in terms of some good news for us in 2019, in terms of vector-borne diseases, we have not had any recorded cases of them, even though we would have done well over 40 tests to clarify whether or not certain suspected cases of dengue were for real. So I repeat, for 2019, we have had no reports of vector-borne illnesses, either by mosquitoes or rodents, etc. And this is a big change for us, considering where we were in December 2016, when we would have, until then, been dubbed as a Zika territory, and that created much headache for us, the Ministry of Tourism, and our tourism product. We would also be continuing in our gains that we have made in terms of the EMTCT, which is the elimination of mother-to-child transmission. We are well into the phase two of that program, which would be in, um, continuing over to the elimination of hepatitis B and Chagas disease in pregnant women. So we are going forward to EMTCT plus, which is the step beyond the qualification that we have just had. We continue to get good results from our district medical officers test clinic at the Connery Community Center, which was launched in 2018. Dr. Maria Warner ably manages that facility several afternoons per week, and it has helped to fill a void for the people who live between Canada, Keys, North Frigate Bay, as well as the, Con the Connery community itself, and persons living in and around Kitstadat. And I can tell you that for 2019, some 146 regular patients are being seen. So it basically continues to make the case for us from the pilot that we're doing that the next new health center in St. Kitts and Nevis will have to be one in Connery. The STEP survey is being undertaken. The honorable mover of the bill would have spoken to that quite extensively, indicating that the survey is being done so that we can trace basically the incidence of HIV, sorry, NCDs in the country, and trying to develop a mechanism of monitoring and evaluating the gains that we are trying to make with the NCD programming we currently have, while at the same time developing new programming to help to reverse the incidence of NCDs and to reduce the rate of mortality that we are suffering. I cannot go through this budget without dealing with some health indicators for the country to give us what can for the want of a better term, can be described as a state of the nation's health. Our population stands presently at 49,101 persons. And of course, 12,773 is on Nevis and 36,328 on St. Kitts. Life expectancy has gone up slightly. And of course, we basically in 2012 would have been at 68.8 years. Now it's 74 years is the average. For females, um, this, um, females are now living to 78 years as opposed to uh, men who are living to 76. So the women are still living slightly longer than men. And we have to take that into, con into the context that St. Kitts and Nevis over the years, over the last 40, 50 years and more, would have had a massive improvement in the conditions of living and the socio-economic general situation, when you take into context that in 1950, the life expectancy in this country was only pegged at 50, 50 years of age, and we are now into the 70s. For women, the late 70s, and for men, just above the mid-70s. Total births in 2019, 540. 
with 455 of those um, being live, being total live births. And uh, for Nevis, we've had 455, um, just bear with me for a moment. Nevis would have had 82 of the births with 15 of them being, 15% um, being males or 40 and females 42. And of course in Senkits, we would have had 458 births. The total still births for us has only been two which shows us that um, we are doing better in terms of antenatal care, but it also shows us that there is a 9.8% drop in the birth rate since 2018. We did have five um, cases of multiple births. All five were in Senkits with five sets of twins. We are also um, wishing to continue the trend uh, they're not wishing, but it is happening in reality, where we are noticing that 81% of the births in St. Kitts and Nevis seems to be um, categorized as follows. When it comes to St. Kitts, that 81% is to single women, while in Nevis, 72% to single um, women. For purposes of the civil registry, we also provide data in terms of married couples, where 19% of those births would have gone there at that um, pace. For St. Kitts and Nevis, 23%. Registered deaths for 2019, we've had a total of 301 up to November 30th, with um, 156 males and 145 females. Of the 301, 49 would have been recorded in Nevis, and 252 in St. Kitts, and basically most of the deaths, or 78.4%, is occurring in the age range 45 to 89. We are also seeing the highest number of deaths in Nevis being recorded in the parish of St. Paul's with 38 deaths, but that is not surprising because it is Nevis's most densely populated parish. Similar um, correlations can be made for St. Kitts, where we would have had 197 deaths at, in St. George, which is our most densely populated parish in St. Kitts. And of course, so this is what we are facing with right now. In terms of deaths of children, thankfully, there have only been three deaths of children between the ages of one to four. And this is a marked increase, however, because last year we did not record any deaths of children between the ages of one and four. <coughs> However, we did record some nine infant deaths, and infant deaths are cla um, classified as deaths occurring to children who are not yet five years old, so there's a difference. So somewhere between the four and the five is when you're seeing these nine deaths occurring, and there have been more female children in that regard than males. And uh, last year, we would have had uh, some 13 deaths in that category, so there is a slight reduction. We would have also recorded some seven neonatal deaths, which represents 22.2% reduction in those deaths over 2018. Four perinatal deaths, which are stillbirths, uh, deaths that occur within seven days of birth. We've also recorded that as well. And regrettably, we have had one maternal death up to November 30th, and even though it's only one debt, it represents a 50% reduction because last year we had two. We are never happy when a mother has to die rather than living to enjoy the thrill of having a newborn child and the hope of raising that child to adulthood. But that's life and how it goes. We would have seen that there were no babies in St. Kitts and Nevis that were born with low birth weight. And that tells us that we should have commendations for our antenatal programming in St. Kitts and Nevis. And when we said children born with low birth weight, we mean that they were born weighing less than 1,000 grams. So we are making much headway because when we compare that in 2017, we would have had 55 such births. And now, in 2019, we have had none that were low birth weight babies. So we commend the OBGYN offices in the government health centers, as well as private clinics, the nurses who function as midwives, etc. those who work at the outpatient clinics. We thank you for your hard work. And to close out the whole issue of the commentary on debts in the Federation, I should indicate that of the debts I listed earlier, the 301, the leading causes are as follows, cancers, 
235 cardiovascular disease we have as 173 as well because some of these have coexisting conditions as well we've had deaths due to diabetes complication 127 cerebrovascular incidents or strokes 116 and so forth and of course these figures that i'm now giving you are figures on average from 2014 to 2019 so it tells us that we have some work to do in terms of our ncds for which cancer is the most deadly the teen pregnancy rate for girls aged 12 to 19 for purposes of our health demographic. Nevis would have recorded seven, St. Kitts would have recorded 44. Again, we are seeing a marked reduction because it then means that in 2018, we would have had 54 such births. And in 2016, we had 95 of these births. So the reduction is pleasant news because it then means that our teenage girls can then finish their education without having it being interrupted by an unplanned pregnancy, so we are grateful. In terms of our cancer case, our NCD cases for 2019, we would have seen an incidence in St. Kitts of 54 cases, of which 37 are females. And we are also noticing a continuing trend where in St. Kitts, breast cancer is the leading form of cancer, and in Nevis, it is prostate cancer. And then that leads us to the three leading cancers in the Federation, which are breast, prostate, and colorectal. Hypertension, we would have had registered at our 17 health centers, 2,231 persons, and a total of 80% of these registered hypertensive cases are over the age of 60. Diabetes, we would have recorded at our clinics, 1,827 cases at the 17 health centers, and 69.8% of them are over age 60. So that is an age range that we have to work on. We have to do the work long before you begin treating people at that age because by then the exposure would have been well set in terms of their confirmation of that particular diagnosis. So we do have quite a bit of work to do in that regard. Amputations, of course, as a result of diabetes prevalence were 43 for 2019. In 2018, we would have had 31 of those. I should note that um, in response to the rate of amputations, which includes the removal of digits and fingers, or maybe lower limbs, etc., completely, that we are in the process with the Cuban government of having an arrangement done to introduce Hebrapot, which is a world-recognized drug that has been on the market in certain US states. Our information is that it's available in St. Vincent, and it has shown great progress and great results in terms of reducing the likelihood of amputations. So during the recent visit here of the Junior Minister of Foreign Affairs, we would have made representation again to him and via our Ambassador Werner Mills in Cuba to have samples of the Hebropod sent to CAFA's lab in Jamaica for efficacy, as is the CARICOM requirement, before we introduce the drug in St. Kitts and Nevis. So that is one thing in 2020 we are looking forward to, to reduce that rate of amputation, knowing that it has impact on the individual in terms of loss of income, change of livelihood, end of livelihood, etc. Um, of the cases of diabetes and hypertension, I should note that in St. Kitts, the highest numbers of cases have been recorded in Newtown, Old Road, St. Peter's and Sandy Point on St. Kitts. And for Nevis, those cases would be concentrated most in Gingerland and Charlestown. I indicated earlier the amount of persons we, have, we would have had on dialysis. Up until November 30th, we would have had about 30 of them and maybe between one and two peritoneal cases because there was one transition that would have taken place over to the hemodialysis side of that treatment protocol. The eye clinic in 2019 would have had some 3,857 uh, med um, consultations and uh, this would have also resulted in the following statistics. We have 58% of the uh, patients are females, and 36% of these cases were glaucoma cases. They, we did have about 681 cataract cases with 43 requiring surgery, 
And then there were also 222 pterygium cases with 58 requiring surgery. The highest patient flows at the eye clinic at JNF are for persons diagnosed with glaucoma. The second highest for patient flow are persons with cataracts and pterygium diagnoses. The eye clinic did not report any cases of conjunctivitis for this year, which is commonly known as red eye, and that differs from last year where we had 59 cases, so that is a wonderful improvement over 20. 18. The oncology unit, as of the end of October, we would have had some 255 patients referred to the unit, and that is an increase of 166% over the previous year because we would have had 96 patients being referred then. And as a result of that, the government in the 2020 budget will be putting forward for yet another increase in the pharmaceutical vote because um, chemotherapy drugs are not cheap. And as a result of that, we would, have, we would be adding some $200,000 on top of what we've already done in 2018, which was $510,000 already being allocated. We would have had 54 of the 255 patients referred, 54 new cases of cancer, and of them, 45 are on treatment, 32 females, 13 males. And of course, the most frequent diagnoses we have seen among these patients at the oncology unit are colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and ovarian cancer. And unfortunately, we have also seen 11 cancer deaths in 2019. On to mental health, we have seen some 73 clinic sessions being held with 704 patients in attendance. And these would have been done both at Her Majesty's prison where we recorded some 139 mentally ill patient contacts over 18 clinics. And also, the, there, there would have also been the rest of the patients being seen at the various mental health clinics throughout the Federation. We should also note that there was a total of 134 patients up until October 31st who were awarded throughout the year at the Jane France General Hospital psychiatric wing at some point or other throughout the course of the year. And the top five diagnoses for these admissions would have been psychosis, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, alcohol, and schizoaffective disorder. And some 68%, 66%, sorry, of the psychiatric patients are males. In terms of the mental health day treatment center, we would have had 46 patients being received at that facility since we started to the public in September 2017. Some of them are regular clients, some of them come periodically, depending on if there are flare-ups in their condition, perhaps maybe in terms of failure to take medication, etc. However, 50% of these cases are between 20 and 29. Here again, we are seeing a continuing trend, just like with HIV, where the younger demographics are also suffering more when it comes to diagnosed mental illnesses. And of course, the leading diagnosis at the Mental Health Day Treatment Center, similar to what we are seeing at JNF, schizophrenia, drug-induced psychosis, marijuana-induced psychosis, depressive disorders, and polysubstance dependence, which is a combination of alcohol and other drugs. Two teenagers, unfortunately, are presently being treated at the Mental Health Day Treatment Center and they are being treated for schizophrenia and marijuana-induced psychosis. We also must speak about the dental unit, and in this regard, I wish to remind the public that the dental services in St. Kitts and Nevis would have expanded to what it should have been many years ago when we had the full complement of three government-run dental units. In October, when we put in stats, however, from the end of October, but then I'm also reporting in that regard that we would have reopened the dental unit at Mary Charles Hospital, so that has helped. And it helped particularly more so because we would have had to temporarily close the Newtown Dental Clinic because of widespread termite infestation. However, now that all three facilities are back up and running, we have seen remarkable increases in terms of patient flow. For example, we would have seen some 2,423 dental extractions, 
930 permanent fillings, 369 temporary fillings. And then you, when you compare that to what we had before, it is telling you that perhaps maybe patients would have been holding back in terms of getting dental treatment because they did not want the long drive to Sandy Point when only one dental unit was operable at the time, Mary Child still being out of commission, and then, of course, the temporary closure in Newtown. So we are very grateful that we have restored those services to full. The Newtown Dental Unit would have been reopened in February, and the one at Mary Child's in July of 2018. And, of course, the heaviest patient flows are at Newtown in number one position, with 6,183 patients, Pogson in number 25302, and Mary Charles, 5,090. In terms of our projects, Madam Deputy Speaker, for 2019, I wish to emphasize that the ministerial allotment for the Ministry of Health, as I had said earlier, is 61.9 million. I also wish to remind the public at this point that PAHO has set a benchmark by which member states should govern their allocations to health care. And that benchmark for the international community among the PAHO member states is 6% of GDP. Now, based on my rough calculation, the GDP of St. Kitts and Nevis is some $1 billion. And based on the amount that we have allocated to health, it tells us that we are at 8%. So St. Kitts and Nevis has even surpassed the PAHO benchmark when it comes to provisions for health care. And I am very grateful for that. I should also indicate that the, basically for the four, as I had done for the four preceding budgets, the government, the Ministry of Finance, especially during the estimates periods, would have been very open to the new initiatives being put forward by the Ministry of Health in terms of what we want to see as transformation in the health sector. And that has been demonstrated by the consistent increases in health allocations over the years. And if you can just indul indulge me for a moment, Madam Deputy Speaker, I took the time to do some quick research in terms of the Ministry of Health, in terms of what has been spent in successive budgets starting from the year 2008. And these are the combined figures for recurrent expenditure and capital expenditure rounded off. 2008, 40.5 million was allocated. 2009, 35.7. 2010, 34.8 million. 2011, 34.9. 2012, 35.8. 2013, 43.8 million. 2014, 48.1 million. 2015, 52 million. And then in 2016, when we had our first budget, 61 million. 2017, 62.6 million. 2018, we dipped slightly because we would have made, completed some major capital improvements by then, 57.1 million. In 2019, 60.6 .6 million. And our proposed figure, as I've said twice before, for 2020 is almost 62 million, which is 61,953,408. ,000, and how do I break all of this down, Madam Deputy Speaker? It shows us that in the very first year that Team Unity took office, we would have added, in first blush, some 17.3% increase in the health budget over the previous year. And then if we were to go further in terms of, for example, let's say the 2010 allocation, which was 34.8 million, by 2016, when we had our first health budget, we would have put a whopping 75% increase in budget under the appropriation bill to the Ministry of Health. So I say all of this to say this, that Team Unity has put its money where its mouth is when it comes to spending adequately on health care. I then proceed, Madam Deputy Speaker, to the 2020 projections and human resource provisions that we are asking for when it comes to the 2020 budget. Of course, the reconstruction of the Tabernacle Health Center would have already been earmarked. That project is to the tune of 2.4 million. Of course, all of this is being built around the strategic plan for health, which comes to an end in 2021 and for which in 2020, 
we will begin doing more work in terms of getting a successor to that plan. We are also requesting 23 new positions for the Ministry of Health, one quality assurance officer to deal with infection control and quality control issues, especially as the hospital gets ready to be considered for accreditation as a teaching hospital, official accreditation. And at the same time, it would also be a requirement when it comes to the introduction of the National Health Insurance Scheme. One health promotion coordinator to assist with our more aggressive build out of the health promotion programming as it relates to NCDs. One HIV case manager to help us address this problem that we are having with not enough persons who are testing positive, getting into care and being properly counseled. So there's one extra position. A statistician's post, 50 nursing attendance posts are being requested to help us address the short staffing issue at the hospital, particularly for the medical ward. Two nurse preceptor posts to assist with the training and in some cases retraining of some nurses to make sure that we improve the quality of services we give to patients at the hospital and especially to address the failure rate that we are seeing with the regional examination of nurse registration, which is a requirement for licensing throughout the CARICOM region. We are also requesting one position for a nurse anesthetist and one client flow customer service officer to deal with the front section of JNF in terms of being of more service to patients, to visitors, etc., when they first approach the hospital. We have one person already in that role who was an EMT officer who has been trained in communication skills, but this additional person will help us with a second shift. Salary and wages increase in 2019. I'm also happy to report, Madam Deputy Speaker, that in 2020, we are requesting a significant increase in salaries for our nurses, and this increase is to the tune of $1.1 million. And it will benefit all of the nurses, whether they're nursing attendants, enrolled nursing assistants, staff nurses, assistant nurse managers, nurse managers, as well as the community-based nurses, those who are nurse managers, as we know those who we are brown, and those who are district nurses. So that is also a request that we have asked for. I should also note at this point that in 2019, a private donor who prefers to remain anonymous has started with our involvement a monthly recognition program for nurses, which is now into its eighth or ninth month. That recognition program comes with, it's basically done on a peer review basis where we pick three nurses per month and each of those nurses receives an award of $1,000 per month. So we are grateful to that donor who has chosen to remain anonymous. Capital pro um, projects for 2020. Of course, I would have mentioned the continued build out of the cardiac catheterization unit. The amount being requested for that is 1.5 million. That unit is being earmarked for placement as an annex to the ICU unit at the hospital for obvious reasons and uh, hopefully by the end of January, the core pieces of equipment should be arriving in the Federation. As I indicated earlier, phase one is the build out of the testing procedures, the point of care testing at the A&E department, which will be put in place by the end of this month. The phase three of the JNF France Hospital would have also gone into a new phase. If my memory is correct, we have out to tender a renewed request in terms of the design of the facility because the original design is no longer viable based on the challenges that we are now seeing relative to the indications when it comes to health care, our rates of death, problems with NCDs, etc. There should be in 2019 a brand new health center being constructed in St. Peter's and this is to address the fact that the building has outgrown its size if we were to do demographic studies of the Bastia Valley area and beyond, going towards the east, we would recognize that the only place where we can build out would be up in the St. Peter's area, because that's where a lot of new housing would have gone. And uh, of course, that means that we have more patients that we have to care for. So it is estimated that the project should start in the first quarter and be completed by the end of 2020. 
There will also be the renovation to a property at Fortlands, which would be one of those units that would have traditionally housed health professionals from overseas. That particular facility is being repurposed for the permanent home of the Spectrum Center for Autism. That center is a joint initiative of the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education. We have some 65 children who are diagnosed as autistic already in St. Kitts alone, and they are being cared for and receiving therapies in a very tiny space at the Ponza Daycare facility next to TDC, in a space that is barely 12 feet by 10 feet, which cannot be permanent. And we also, at the same time, have another 12 children at the Cotton Thomas School who have not been diagnosed. So we need to pay some attention to those. And this particular facility has also had commitments from the private sector to assist us in the refurbishment. The offer that is in front of us is that the labor costs will be provided by the private sector. Parents of children who are autistic are also supporting the venture. And we also, as of last year's UNGA, side meeting agenda would have had commitments from Autism Speaks, an international NGO geared towards autism. And of course, some of that support from last year would have been indicated, am I right, Minister Richards from Tiffany and Company? Thank you. So those are the types of areas of support that we are seeing forthcoming. We are presently conducting an exercise in Nevis to do some diagnosis on children in Nevis who may be autistic as well, so that we can get them into care, but then ultimately a similar facility will have to be built on Nevis to accommodate those children on a regular basis. I would um, say in closing off my section on health, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Ministry wishes to confirm to the public that we have met all of our international quota contributions com um, and commitments as follows, PAHO, US $21,300, CAFO, $41,772, Caribbean Accreditation of Medical Councils, CAMC, which is $1,500 US, Caribbean Accreditation Authority for Education in Health Professionals, US $4,966.50, WHO, US $4,780, I would also like to state at this point that if you go through the budget, you would also notice that there is a reduction in the subvention that would traditionally have been given to Solid Waste Management Corporation. And that is largely due to the fact that Solid Waste Management Corporation is now very solvent. And they would have been in the habit of receiving on a monthly basis 125,000 US per month from the ministry's budget, or 1.5 million per year. So for 2020, the Ministry of Finance would have weaned some 500,000, weaned it down to 500,000. So we are grateful for that. As the honorable member for number two on her departure stated, solid waste has been solvent for a long time. That is true. But then at the same time, you just couldn't drop them willy-nilly because they, de they are al already engaged in certain investment projects which will have to be funded. We have one new initiative for 2019, which for the first time we are going to be called upon to pay into, and that is the World Pediatric Project, where for 2020 we will have to be making a contribution of 26,100. And what is the World Pediatric Project? It is a project that for many, many years has been of benefit to the children of St. Kitts and Nevis, especially those that were born with cleft palates and hair lips, ear deformities, melanomas or childhood cancers, and they would have benefited through the collaboration of the Pediatric Assistance League of St. Kitts with assistance for them and their parents to travel either to the U.S. or St. Vincent and the Grenadines to receive life-changing and life-improving surgeries. And we are now being called upon for the first time to contribute to it, and I think that it is money well spent, because when we looked at how much they would have spent on the children of St. Kitts and Nevis, even in the last five years, it is well over a half a million dollars. So that contribution is something that we are quite willing to make. If I, with your leave, Madam Deputy Speaker, can proceed to speaking about the Ministry of Social Services, that ministry, which also includes community development and gender affairs, there's a recurrent expenditure um, estimate of $34,058,814. 
and the current account, uh, the current capital projects, sorry, at 3.6 million for a total allocation of 37 million 664 611 which represents a 9.6 percent increase over 2019. now this ministry is the core ministry in the government that deals with the issues of social assistance assistance to the poor the indigent the elderly the differently able children who are at risk at risk for various issues and conditions and also other vulnerable groups and the core goal of this ministry is to make sure that the persons of this country who are in need get to live lives that are meaningful and lives of dignity. The country's deepening burden faced by NCDs has been felt by this ministry quite, quite sharply, obviously, because NCDs do not happen to be respecters of persons, and persons who are in need or poor or indigent they don't get special treatment when it comes to these illnesses. So we are being hampered by that as well, as most other ministries are for that matter. In keeping with regional trends, we are also seeing a continued pattern where more of our people are living to age 100 and beyond. We had the distinction in 2017 of having for the first time some 19 centenarians. Regrettably, a number of them have died. In 2019, at present, we only have three because there have been some deaths, including the oldest living person in our history, being Cillian Webb, who, um, Cillian um, Powell, sorry, who would have died at the age of 107. I should, with some regret, note at this point that our only male centenarian that we had left, Mr. Samuel Deposo of Challengers, has recently died in North Carolina. And if he had lived, he died just 10 days shy of his 104th birthday. And uh, we are sorry for that loss. And we extend on behalf of the government sincere condolences to his family. Our aging population continues to require special care. And that care is mostly rendered through the Ministry of Health, as well as the home care services that are provided by this particular ministry. We also continue to manage the New Horizon Rehabilitation Center. We are presently, we have 13 residents, seven females and six males. These children are there under two modalities, one being a place of alternative sentences, sentencing for children who are in conflict with the law, and also being a, a place of care and protection for children who have been deemed fit to receive such care. Now, we have also been going through a UNICEF project relative to the improvement to that facility, because unfortunately, when it was opened in 2013, there were no standard operating procedures <coughs> that were put in place. And as a result of that, UNICEF has provided us with some valuable assistance, as well as the OECS Juvenile Justice Project. And we now have the benefit of those interventions and recommendations. The children at the facility continue to do very well in terms of CXC examinations. For the second year in a row, we have experienced 100% passes with those children. And for this year, the subject areas that were set include English A, the Electronic Document Preparation and Management, which is the EDPM. Last year, they would have included those two subjects with the addition of Mathematics, Social Studies, and Office Administration. Persons with disabilities, as I noted earlier, their, their assistance comes to the same ministry. As such, the St. Kitts Nevis Association of Persons with Disability continue to occupy rent-free accommodations at the McKnight Community Center. They receive a monthly budgetary support of 2,500 to cover some group activities and also the cost of the driver for the SIDF-funded special purpose vehicle that is given to them. We would have only just at the cabinet, maybe about a week and a half ago, approved the allocation of a piece of land for them to build a multi-purpose center. And uh, of course, they are heartened by this gesture because the international donor community would be now partnering with them to do that. We continue to respond to their requests for assistance. A number of them would naturally would have been benefiting from the poverty alleviation program because their disability renders a lot of them incapable of earning a decent standard of living by virtue of the jobs that they cannot do due to their disability. So these are some of the areas in which we've assisted them. 
we would have also ratified the Convention at the UN of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Cabinet would have approved that in 2016 April, and it was just in the margins of the 2019 UNGA that the Prime Minister would have signed final ratification documents. So the Ministry is quite proud of the record that we are de developing in terms of reaching out to persons with disabilities. The Ministry is also providing coverage to the child probation and welfare clients at the Ministry. We have some 60 children in foster care, 40 males, 20 females, and of course 21 of these are in the care of families which is a better situation for them. We also have a situation where the ministry continues because of its social outreach and our custodial functions as it relates to social safety net programs. We are providing funding for food vouchers. In 2019, thus far, we have provided food vouchers to some 356 persons to the tune of 806,997.75. In addition, we would have spent in medical assistance for 2019 thus far 645,787 and then another 76,872 for 58 charitable burials in St. Kitts. We are, like everybody else, would be looking forward to the full build out of the national insurance programming so that we can then have a more efficient management of these types of medical assistance that we continue to render through the Ministry of Social Services. Gender Affairs continues to do very good work with the Special Victims Unit within the police. We have a staff of five. They continue to do programming with the Viola Project, Viola Project for teen mothers, giving them the ability to go back to school. Also addressing the issues of domestic violence and here is where I said in my previous comments on the health that I will come back to the issue of domestic violence because as of 2019, the 30th of November, we uh, would have recorded some 80 cases of domestic violence but, um, on female victims, while only seven on male victims for a total of 87 reported instances of domestic violence. The data, thankfully, is trending downwards compared to 2018 when there were 90 reported cases by female victims representing an 11% drop. And in like fashion, there has been a marked reduction in the number of male domestic violence victims, decreased being pegged at the rate of 76.7 over last year's figures. We wish to use this opportunity, Madam Deputy Speaker, to remind the public that domestic violence is not a feminized issue of crime. There are men out there who continue to suffer from domestic violence. It is underreported. Some will tell you that they don't go to the police because they will be seen as weak. But the fact is, violence is still violence. And we still have to do quite a bit of work on our citizens in terms of letting them know that putting your hand on somebody is not the way to resolve issues. You have no right to control the life of somebody else, either by blows or by verbal abuse or anything of that nature. And I should at this point indicate that when it comes to domestic violence, it is not just physical violence. It is also verbal abuse, psychological abuse, etc. In a letter that I would have received from the magistrate's court dated the 5th of December, there was confirmation that some 32 cases of domestic violence were filed Nine cases were fully disposed of, and another 17 are still pending. By extension, the Department of Gender Affairs confirms that some 22, 24 cases of domestic violence would have been reported to their unit, and all 24 of them would have been referred to the Special Victims Unit. And why is that important that all 24 reported? The reason is that just last year, the government launched for the first time the Domestic Violence and Complaints and Reporting Protocol, which basically sets out the standard operating procedures that should obtain between the Ministry of Health to the hospitals, also private doctors, as well as the police, as well as the counseling services of the government. So the protocol is working in that all cases that the unit would have received would have been dealt with by the Special Victims Unit of the police. In 2018, there was a 50-50 spread in terms of the distribution of verbal abuse cases. 
And in 2019, we now have the exact opposite, where no such cases were reported by males, but in 2018, there were 22 cases of verbal abuse with women and 21 reported by men. Up to November 2019, there would have been one case reported in terms of sexual violence. However, we listened to the news and we know there was at least one other case that became public. And as I said earlier, just because we have a case or cases being made public, it does not mean that the rate of sexual violence is increasing. What it means is that perhaps for the first time, more victims are choosing to, have to be courageous enough to come forward and report the incident to the police. As I would have indicated, from January to August of 2019, the A&E department at JNF would have treated three cases. All three of them, unfortunately, had to be admitted to hospital due to the trauma of the attack. And uh, we wish to see a gradual reduction in this particular area. And we continue to admonish our parents and our guardians that we need to probably change the way we socialize young girls in terms of how they value themselves and the boundaries that they set with the men in their lives who would like to think of them as property when they are not. And uh, I, maybe I came from the old school, but I grew up with a nevis mother who told me that people treat you how you allow them to treat you. And that is the message we need to get across to our young women if we are going to see changes in this regard. All of our community centers are directly managed by the Ministry of Community Development, Department of Community Development. And of course, a number of them had to be repaired during the course of the year due to termite problems. Some of these would not have been fit for purpose any longer, such as Lodge. And uh, on the issue of Lodge, I will make a special notation a while later. And then the one at Parsons is also not fit for purpose as well. When com completed, as we have already begun in 2018, these community centers will continue to function as satellite centers for the Ministry of Social Services, meaning that the same services that you have to traditionally come to Bar State to Victoria Road to get, you can go in eventually to each and every community center and get those services met. In other words, we want to place the centers to be at full service to the communities that they serve, so that they are available to them and not put, be put aside as white elephants for the most part. We still manage the counseling unit, which was previously housed at Greenlands. In 2018, I would have indicated that the ministry and that department would be part of a USAID Youth Empowerment Services project for Family Matters Counseling and it is geared towards 10 to 17 year old children. It is a successful program and the program, although funded by USAID, comes to an end in 2020. So as a result of that, we would be making requests for the absorption of seven of these counselors to assist us with the continued programming. We do have a situation in the ministry, Madam Deputy Speaker, where a number of our home care officers are continuing to approach age 55, and the ministry is now going to be embarking in 2020 on a recruitment drive to replace those individuals. Because looking after persons who are sick, not to mention the elderly who could have, some of them can hardly move themselves, can be very taxing physically and otherwise on the persons who are responsible for their care. So we do appreciate the amount of physical and emotional stress that our home care officers endure in the care of these persons. We have about 21 of these home care officers in St. Kitts, serving about 265 clients. We are in the process of rebuilding the Department of Gender Affairs. As I indicated, we only have five staff. And because of the programming needs that are being built out, we have to make provisions for more staff to get the kind of results we would like to see at the community level and in terms of our social fabric. We continue to manage the Saddler's Home for the elderly and we continue to hail the partnership that we have been able to have with the private sector individual whose pa uh, mother would have donated the building to the government. We would like to encourage other citizens who may have houses around the Federation that are sitting idle, that if they wish to enter into similar arrangements with the government, we will be only too happy to put down similar centers at other locations in St. Kitts because it is a useful service for us. There's also a greater need 
for our um, aversion programming as well as diversion programming when it comes to our young people to channel them into meaningful positive lifestyles and we also have to make sure that we do everything in our power to complete what we, are, what we already have in terms of our build out for under the various initiatives that the ministry is undertaking. What are some of our special achievements for 2019? They include, as I said earlier, the complete ratification of the rights of persons with disabilities as of September 2019. I also, at this juncture, would like to make two interventions, Madam Deputy Speaker, having to do with some of our other UN commitments that have suffered quite a bit of delinquency, delinquency that we would have inherited. For example, in 1989, the UN would have approved the Convention on the Rights of the Child. In 1990, by February, I think, St. Kitts and Nevis would have been perhaps the first country to ratify that convention. Now, when that was done, we would have had the responsibility, as any country does, and any country has, rather, with um, UN conventions to be reporting regularly to the UN how these conventions are being operated in practice. We would have turned in a report, which was our only report in 1997. None had been turned in since. The second report was due two years after the signing and every five years thereafter. I'm happy to report that for the last two years, that ministry has been working assiduously to get this reporting up to date and our cabinet has now completed the periodic reports covering multiple years and we have now gotten to the point of passing that report to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs so that we can begin a mock review session in preparation for the peer review requirement that is shortly coming up in Geneva. So that is something that we can look to as a major achievement of this government when it comes to UN obligations. The second UN obligation that we inherited a state of delinquency with is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which would have been ratified since 1985. However, we inherited a situation upon taking office where the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and the eight national periodic reports were never done, covering the period from 2002. These reports should be submitted every four years. The last review was done in 2002, when one report, well, report number one to four was submitted in one go. So that is why we were delinquent from the fifth onward. Cabinet, I'm happy to report, after the two years of work that the ministry has put in with the help of UN women, have been able to approve the new report, the completed and updated reports, which would be transmitted shortly to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs again, so that we can then register for mock sessions in preparation for our peer review in Geneva. So I wish to thank the staff of the Ministry of Social Services for the hard work that they put in on this. It was a bad legacy to have inherited, but at least now we have come out of the black books of the UN when it comes to these two conventions, and I'm very grateful for that. If I may move on to 2020 projects and initiatives, I would like to first start by indicating with pleasure that this budget for 2020 seeks to have a continuation of the poverty alleviation program that was launched in December 2018. If one would care to go to the first volume of the estimates for this year, I'm trying to remember the section, I think it is page 20, um, 21 rather, we will find that under the head, um, the public assistance head to manage community development, that there is an earmark there for 26.6 million, of which 24.7 million has been earmarked for the poverty alleviation program. As we know, this programming is meant for persons whose household combined income is less than $3,000. I should also point out at this point that as the honorable move of the bill would have indicated, we have some 4,000 households that are benefiting from this particular project. Now, it is undeniable that the poverty alleviation program has made a marked difference in the lives of the persons who are beneficiaries of this particular project. And while I am doing that, I would also like to point out 
several comments that were made by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition when it come, in his statement on Friday morning when it comes to the Poverty Alleviation Program. In his comments about conjecturing as it relates to why we've withheld the IMF report, one of the things he's accused the government of, or maybe it was just conjecture meant to be, meant to be mischievous, that the reason that we are probably withholding the report is because we don't want to admit what the IMF might have had to say about the Poverty Alleviation Program. And that, Madam Deputy Speaker, is downright what ludicrous. It, what could it be allowed by releasing the report? Okay, here is why it is ludicrous. It what has nothing to do conjecture? with the releasing of the report. Conjecture? Madam Deputy Speaker, every single person in this country knows that the data gathering exercise for the Poverty Alleviation Program began in July of 2018. The IMF reports are normally out by mid-summer, by, by mid-year, sorry, and the Poverty Alleviation Program was not launched till December. Okay? There is no need to explain it were it not for the fact that we have people who are deliberately mischievous. The other thing that the Honorable Move um, Leader of the Opposition stated is that based on the 2007-2008 country poverty assessment, there were 11,927 households in St. Kitts and Nevis. This, to Madam Deputy Speaker, is an inaccuracy. If the Honorable Leader of the Opposition had read the reports, the four volumes of the reports properly, when it comes to the country poverty assessment for 2007-2008, he would have noticed that the figure of the 11,927 was the number of households in St. Kitts alone, not St. Kitts and Nevis. And then if he had done some simple math, he could have figured out what the balance of the households were for Nevis. So I will do the math for him now, in his absence. The report also stated that some 6.2% of the population of households were forming part of the household survey, which is equivalent to 958 households. What this means, if my math that in, I learned in school is correct, that if you solve for the variable, it then tells you that the total number of households in St. Kitts and Nevis at the time was 15,452, of which the, the variable that he didn't get was Nevis having 3,525 households. He also stated that the poverty alleviation made 4,000 extra people poorer. I don't know how you could, by any stretch of the imagination, use data from 2008 when you had the last poverty assessment survey, and by the way, they need to be done by every eight years, so we're more than late in terms of doing it. And then at the same time, expect everything to remain constant because then it would basically contradict all of the claims and boasting that the former administration put down more houses than anybody else. Because it then means that if you're assuming everything remains constant, that they didn't build any houses between, since 20, 2008, and then this government didn't build any since we took office either. So you're trying to compare apples and oranges. And how could you say 4,000 persons have been made poorer when we are going by households? That's the first thing. Standards of living would have changed, consumer price indices would have changed, as well as inflation rates would have changed by virtue of the cost of goods and services. So until we have the data coming forward from the already in progress country poverty assessment, I think it's a real irresponsible and fast stretch to be coming up with this type of creative mathematics. However, I will continue. I will continue. Basically, all of the provisions that we have put place in terms of the Poverty Alleviation Program have been done in tandem with the Social Protection Bill that had its first reading in this House since March of 2018. And what the Cabinet would have done in order to properly prepare for the implementation of the Poverty Alleviation Program is to go into the bill and activate in advance an interministerial committee which the bill calls for in the administration of social services and social justice for the people of this country who need help in being ensured that they can have a decent standard of living in keeping with the basic human rights conventions going back to 1948. I should, that is all I wish to say on that particular part, um, issue, Madam Deputy Speaker. And if I may, with your leave, continue to the Boys Mentorship Program which is a program started for gender affairs several years ago, launched at the Sandy Point High School. We now have a total of 24 young men in that program, and we have built out to other schools since then. 
In 2020, the intention is to deal with Keon and Washington Archibald High School, now that we've dealt with Bastia High and Charles E. Mills. And of course, this is going to take extra manpower to do so, and this particular program will also be done with the wider program that is already in place to the Ministry of National Security as it relates to the explorers clubs that are being formed in the various communities. Our outreach to the elderly will continue throughout 2020. With your leave, Madam Deputy Speaker, could I ask for 30 minutes? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The other intention as it relates to the continued work of the ministry is to ensure that the household registry that has already been invested in would have been accommodating the data for those individuals who are eligible for the poverty alleviation program, given that case management is being built in into that poverty alleviation program because it is not intended for people to remain in the state that they're in. We prefer to teach people to fish. Okay, so that is the other build out of that particular programming for that, uh, that um, in the ensuing year, rather. If I can now move on to the provisions that we are also looking for, other provisions in 2020. We are also considering, as it relates to the ratification of the Convention on the Rights of a Child that we would have done in 1990, the optional protocols that also come along with that convention. However, I should state for the record that this particular review is going to take some amount of national consultation and we are hoping that when that time comes that we will have the support of the opposition in this country because one of the provisions basically flies straight in the face of the provisions in the Defense Force Act where the UN has interpreted that by having a cadet corps, it means that you're training people for, people's children for war, which can't be further from the truth. So we need to have some amount of national consultation on that issue and uh, basic consensus on it because when one thinks about the fact that the cadet core is meant to build discipline in young people i don't see how the un can expect us to agree to that at the risk of uh, damaging what we already have in place here in the federation so we are now serving early notice on the opposition that in the new year i will be reaching out to you for your support and your input on this particular matter in terms of our ongoing issues coming forward, we, I wish to report that um, we will continue in terms of the private security at the New Horizon Rehabilitation Center. We have had to put private security at that center once it became evident that Her Majesty's prison management has indicated to us that they could no longer provide security to us, even though some of the residents who are housed there are children who otherwise would have been incarcerated in the regular prison. So that um, private security has cost us $300,000. So I just wanted to make that very clear. In terms of our HR provisions for 2020 that we will be asking for, they include 13 new positions. One, which is a case manager to assist with the caseload of the social assistance beneficiaries. And bearing in mind, we now have 4,000 persons rece receiving assistance with the Poverty Alleviation Program, and we need to inbuild case management around that. That is the reason for that extra post. One deputy director's post to be assigned to the counseling unit, again, because we are building out the counseling unit more fully, now that we've had the input and support from the USAID project. Seven family counselors from that same project we will be asking to um, absorb in the ministry. And in order to build out the boys' mentorship program and to render more support to the explorers movement of the Ministry of National Security, we are also asking for an additional two gender field officers because the ministry only has two all through these years. And of course, I indicated that the new schools that will be considered are Washington Archibald High and also the Kayon High School. There are also two new director's posts that are being requested for New Horizons. This too comes out of the UNICEF report provided by the consultant, Miss Lucy Dawes, who came to us out of the UK. 
and it basically takes into account the changing dynamics that operate at the New Horizon Rehabilitation Center. These direct deputy directors posts will be geared towards operational and maintenance matters and general admin. So those will be the 13 positions that we are asking for. Now, if I may proceed to where I left off earlier in terms of the status of some of the community centers, the one in Lodge is presently not fit for purpose. I think the only thing that happens there is the convening of Domino Games. It's a very tiny building. I don't even think it's as much as 900 square feet. And as a result of that, the Taiwanese embassy, the government of Taiwan has graciously accepted to fund for the people of the Lodge Atlas community a brand new multi-purpose community center. The contract for that um, center, which was due to open tender, has now been awarded by the advice given to me by Public Works Department to a company by the name of John Boy Construction, and the cost of that facility is $3.28 million. We will also continue renovation work at several other community centers to the tune of $200,000. Continued subventions and commitments for the ministry, Madam Deputy Speaker, include rent for the space up at Ade's Place, Greenlands, which is a private sector center started by Dr. Robertine Chatterton, named after her son who suffered from that condition from a particular birth defect. And uh, we pay the rent for that facility to the tune of $1,350. And uh, we have gone further due to the fact that the young people who normally go to that center receive occupational therapy, especially in terms of plant propagation, furniture repair, and refurbishment, especially lawn furniture, patio furniture. They also make arts and craft, jewelry, etc. And uh, this government has chosen to place these children, young people, because all of them are 18 or older, on the STEP program so they get a weekly stipend. Some of these are persons with disabilities, speech defects, physical impairments, etc. A number of them still live in the children's home because that is the only home they have ever had in their entire lives. We also give a $40,000 subvention sorry, to the children's home annually, at which there are some six children presently. Additional support to the children's home include medicals, eyewear, prescriptions, school uniforms, etc., clothing for job attachments when that time comes for them, and also passwords, resets on laptops that had been donated by the USAID program of which they are a part. The children who, there are only two residents who are minors, and that is a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old at that particular center. So that commitment continues for 2020, as well as our annual commitment paid through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the tune of $1,300 US per annum, to the International Migration Office. And we would have heard the member for number nine indicate in his presentation last Friday afternoon that this and all other international obligations of the country are current. In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to add that none of what we are doing here in terms of the Ministry of Health, Social Services, Community Affairs, Gender Affairs could have been made possible without this, um, the support and the assistance and the dedication of the people in the ministries that we have to work with. Whether it's our nurses, doctors, specialists, right down to the custodian, we can't do anything without them. The same goes for the other side of the ministry, home care officers, counselors, the staff of the child probation board, etc., as well as the board members it's, the, itself, because the act provides that they report to the board. And we are very grateful for their support in terms of getting what we want done. I also wish to point out that we will be looking towards the continued support of our partners in the private sector to achieve what we want. And there is one point on that score I wish to stress. And it's a point that keeps being made in this house repeatedly from the other side, Madam Deputy Speaker, with your leave. And it has to do with the fact that the MRI being placed over at Borio. See, as I'm glad he said that. He walked right into it. Never disappoints. Okay? The comment keeps being made in this house why the government had to have this thing being placed over at that place. 
But with your leave, Madam Deputy Speaker, I wish to read into the record a letter which proves that there was an offer to place the same MRI at JNF or near to JNF dated since the 4th of January 2010, which would have been on the eve of the 2010 election. And this letter was written by one Mr. Dr. Andy Redmond of Tyler, Texas, where he wrote the Honorable Prime Minister Denzel Douglas, telling him that he was proud of the advances in the healthcare system that were being made in the country and was wishing to partner with him on several, uh, with the government on several initiatives, including but not limited to CT scan and MRI services. And if I can read with your leave, he then says to them, if I may read, as you are aware, there are several limitations to CT scan images, and an MRI offers improved diagnostic capability, but often at a significant cost. Fortunately, many mobile MRI systems are now available, which are smaller than the traditional ones and can be shipped, plugged in, and ready to go. Basically, he's saying that they can be containerized and placed in a trailer. He then goes on to say that the details of the business arrangement he wants to enter into with the former government are negotiable. But at least I propose that the government provide power and space adjacent to JNF and perhaps cover some of the labor costs. So if you get a letter like this from a petition who is offering to partner with you and you ignore that person for five years and then that individual then decides, well look, well, I still think that this is a need for the country, so since they, therefore the government is not assisting me, I will make provision for it where I have my facility. For the record, I would like to turn in a, letter, a copy of this letter into the record. So when we continue to hear in this house, Madam Deputy Speaker, about the MRI being placed over by the monkey place, it need not be at the monkey place, it could have been at JNF all the time. Okay, in closing, Madam Deputy Speaker, I wish to note that the Ministry of Health has had uh, several debts among the persons who work with us throughout the course of the year, and also people who work with us from overseas who are citizens, and I would like to acknowledge their memory at this point. One of them is our senior clerk, Ms. Beulah Basso, at the Bastia Health Center, who served us for 23 years. The other is Ms. Calvin Mike, a home care officer in the Ministry of Social Services, who served us for 15 years. And the final person is Dr. Winston Isaac, who up until the time of his death, a citizen, had been supporting us with the final build-out of the national aging policy. May their souls rest in peace. I thank you for your indulgence, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I wish this bill safe passage.